Hi, I'm Adrian Schneer, Advancement Coach and Strategist, Lawyer and Professor, and you're listening to the Advancement Spot Podcast, the podcast all about academic and professional skills, strategy, and mindset to help you make big moves to achieve a life beyond your wildest dreams. If you're looking to accomplish more and take your next steps with supportive and experience-informed strategies, look no further. Let's get started. Hi, and welcome to the Advancement Spot Podcast. I'm your host, Adrian Schneer, and I am so grateful that you have taken some time today to spend some here with me. Today, we have Peace Academy joining us on the podcast. Now, I'm so excited to have Peace here. Peace is a grad student completing her master's in the health policy and equity program at York University, which is my alma mater. So big shout out. That's where I did my master's and PhD with two degrees, one in nursing and the other in global health. Peace is interested in the ways in which health and politics merge and the outcomes produced as a result of the confluence between the two. She spends her free time reading books, writing poems, and drinking coffee. Now, I can relate. I have a coffee in front of me where I'm going to be sipping as we go. And Peace, I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, Dr. AJ. And you are not only a listener of the podcast, mm-hmm. but you were also a past student of mine. Yes. <laughs> I'm so full disclaimer, full disclosure. Yep. Peace and I know each other from a little bit before. Mm-hmm. And I'm so excited that Peace is here because, you know, Peace has always been somebody who is, you know, whether it's in the classroom or in the comment section on Instagram, you know, we always have such a fun discussion and let's take it away. So Peace, how are you? <laughs> I am doing well. Thank you for asking. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. So I gave a short introduction, but that's certainly not all there is. Can you give us a little bit more about who you are, what you're doing now, and and how you came to this place of doing your master's? It's huge. It's great. Okay. What do I say? Well, (laughs) your audience already knows my name, Peace Abarachuku Akadima. I was born in Nigeria, and in 2014, my family moved here to Canada. And it's interesting because growing up in Nigeria, I've always wanted to be a lawyer. But my parents were like, nope, you are not going to be a lawyer. You're going to be a nurse. So, and the way that the academic system is structured in Nigeria is quite different. Where when you get to grade 10, you have to choose whether you want to become an art student or a science student. Now, if I went with my initial path to be a lawyer, I would have gone to the art stream. But because my parents insisted that I would become a nurse, I went to the science stream. And I continued that even when I came to Canada. And that was what led me into nursing. Now, in my third year of nursing, I believe I was doing my clinical rotation at Michael Garan Hospital on the psych unit and just looking at the way that our psych patients are treated in the hospital and making that comparison in my head about how it's done in Nigeria really lit something inside of me. I cannot tell you what, but (laughs) what I can tell you is that I just knew in that moment that nursing was not going to be my long-term career. Mm. And after nursing, I immediately went to global health and global health meeting professors like you. And other intelligent professors, Matt, Matt Chipoyer, I have to give him a shout out to. And just learning so much about policies, influence of politics. I think yeah. that all of these things structured my path to now pursue my master's in grad. Well, my master's in health policy and equity. And that is how I got here. Yeah, so I love that. I, I want to talk more about so many things. But the yeah. first thing I want to talk about is your this, this switch in your Ooh. journey. Because you have a nursing degree. Yes, I have and, a nursing degree. <laughs> yes. And when and you were when you were in my class, you were on your shifts, like I remember. And so it's really fun now for me to hear about this shift that has happened. Yes. When I was in your class, I was definitely working as a nursing student. Well, sorry, not as a nursing student, but actually as a as a registered nurse. Yes, I remember. And it's so interesting because I quit that position in the summer of this year to travel down north to work as a nurse. And now that I'm in grad school, I'm not working, but I will actually start working again in two weeks because I got another job as a nurse. So yes, I utilize my nursing degree while making a switch into a whole different career. And I think that it's so important that you say that, that you're yeah. using your nursing degree 
you're making the transition. But I think that even in your work, in your current program and in your current research, you're you're still relying on so many of the skills and so much of the knowledge that you brought with you, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I like that you say that because what I something that I tell people all the time is that my nursing degree is not a waste. The fact that I'm able to contribute critically to any conversation that has to do with health and health policy is because of my background in nursing. And again, global health, of course. But my background in nursing allowed me to, you know, have an insider perspective to what's going on. For instance, in my class on last week Tuesday, we were talking about, I believe, Bill 124 and the way that imp- and the way that policies impact ancillary workers. And I was able to bring up the perspective of how the Bill 124 affects nurses. And we were then able to link that and um, the way that policy affects us to the way that some policies have more deleterious effect on work on professions that are primarily dominated by women. But that would not have been a knowledge that I had had I not had my nursing degree. So I think that it's not a waste. I don't think it's ever going to be a waste, even when I do a complete 180. (laughs) I agree with you. I totally agree with you. And, you know, I felt the same way when I went on, when I was on my journey, nothing that I had done was you know, I, I didn't feel like anything was a waste because everything just helped me build that knowledge. And I always sort of have this vision in my mind of having like this massive filing cabinet in my brain. And the more mm. the more I learn, the more files I have to put things in, you know, the that more is- of a foundation <laughs> that I have for learning. <laughs> that is how I feel now with trying to like figure out what I'm going to do for my MRP. Mm-hmm. There was just so much topics out there. And the more I learn, the more I have to file in my head, you know. <laughs> yeah. So for yeah. our listeners who are in a different master's program, MRP is sort of like it's called major research paper. It's sort of like a master's thesis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you're on your journey figuring out what to do for for, for your research. Yes. That's yes, great. I, I, have, I have an idea of what I want to do. I think it's just figuring out what position that I can mm-hmm. take to enter into that conversation. Obviously, I have to enter from a place of, I don't want to say lack, but I, thought, I want to enter into, I guess, an emergent conversation and see how I can contribute to it. For yeah. sure. I think that that's a great way to put it, an emergent yeah. conversation. And I think something that a lot of grad students actually have a, have trouble with, and a lot of my clients, before they come to work with me, they have trouble with nailing down that question. Ooh. And so the question is often, okay, how do I come up with this research question for my MRP Ooh. or my thesis or even my PhD applicant and student clients will say to me, like, how do I come up with my, my, my topic, my research topic, my research question? Ooh. And quite often the first step, is doing those lit reviews to figure out, okay, where are the gaps? Mm-hmm. Where are the gaps? And those mm-hmm. are where like the real, you know, juicy pieces are for conversation yeah. and where there, there might be that emergent conversation. And maybe mm-hmm. the emergent conversation had like ebbs and flows over time. That's quite possible, but you can reignite yeah. it too, right? Interesting. Interesting. I really, I really like that you say that because I also find even just listening and talking to my classmates, one of the biggest challenges that we have now as, you know, new students who are doing their grad is how to construct a proper research question. Mm. And I think that that is where it's vastly different from undergrad because in undergrad, you are often given a topic and then you're asked to choose a side. Whereas in grad school no one is giving you that topic (laughs) you know you have to figure out your interest and you have to formulate an original research question and you have to so I think that's just how grad school is vastly different from undergrad and that's the beauty of it right that you are your own thinker no one is telling you you have to do this or you have to do that you are finding your supervisors you are finding your support in the faculty Mm -hmm. you are really being resourceful both intellectually and logistically, right, in order to get it done. Absolutely. Yeah, and the other piece is figuring out a question that is not too big, right? Our our questions can be situated in really, really big, heavy things, but our questions have to be doable for the purpose of whatever it is that we're doing. So a question for a master's thesis or MRP is vastly different than a question for for a PhD dissertation, right? And so we have to be really careful to frame the question so that it's appropriate for the level of study that we're at. And I'm not talking about intellectually. I'm talking about the amount of time that you have because research takes time. 
Ooh, right. (laughs) It takes time more so if you have human participants, if you're doing interviews rather than, you know, straight up policy analysis or content analysis, which Mm -hmm. typically you can do, you know, with with fairly few resources. And especially if you're using publicly accessible policy like like I do, like I study Mm -hmm. publicly accessible policy. And so there's so many conversations that I have with students in my classes, my clients about the types of questions that are going to serve you in getting, in making progress, right? You don't want to be stuck with this like massive question that's going to take you four years to answer. And you don't need to have an answer, actually. You need an analysis, right? You you need to make, you just need to make a step. Oh, okay. Right? <laughs> okay. No, 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 because I think you just set me free. <laughs> <laughs> Because I was just talking to my professor a few hours ago that one of my biggest fears is that I am going to start my research and I'm going to find that the connection that I assumed will be there is actually not there. And she's and but that's and your, that that's be, a finding. <laughs> exactly. She said the same thing to me. So I absolutely love that you said I don't need to have an answer. I just need to have analysis. Ooh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> yeah, you need to, I mean, you need to, but that will be your finding, right? Mm-hmm. That what you anticipated, maybe your hypothesis yeah. or null hypothesis, depending on your field, yeah. will be something, you know, will, will be disproven. Yeah. Right? That this isn't the way that the analysis went, but here's what you did find, because you're sure going to find something else, even if yes. you don't find the association or whatever that you think you will. Mm-hmm. No, 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 no. You just set me free. And I think that that is something I'll take with me. I'll, I'll definitely take that with me because for my MRT, I'm not going to talk so much about it because I'm still trying to figure it out. But I keep finding that the connection that I, that the concepts that I want to tie together are treated as exclusive concepts in the literature that I have found. And you know me, I am very feisty. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and I, and I am very sure, I'm certain in my head that there is a connection here. And I want to be the one who makes that connection. So I think it's really liberating for me to know that even if I were to step into this research and find that there is no concrete connection, that that too is okay. It is. It's a, it's a finding. Mm-hmm. It's a finding. And that will allow you to take a further step in your yes. research, right? Yes. Okay, mm-hmm. so there wasn't an association in this way. But maybe there will be in this way, or if you look at this certain population or this community or whatever the case may be. So just because you may or may not find what you think you're going to find, and remember, you always want to come to your research from a place that's as independent as possible, right? Everything is subjective at some level, but when you, the way that you construct your research questions, the way that you conduct your research will be methodologically sound. And that will protect against some bias. But you know, we all sort of have a, a, you know, just an idea of what we think we're going to find or hope we're going to find. And if it's not that, Mm -hmm. then write about it. Yeah. And then figure out why not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to see what I said already. This is liberating to hear. And I I cannot wait to go to class and have this kind of conversations with my friend and even bring this up or even refer them to listen to this particular episode because I think that this is something that we're all struggling with. I don't yeah. want to go into my research paper and then be proven wrong because the question now becomes then what, right? It's really freeing to know this, that there are so many ways that you can approach your research. And even if you hit an impasse here, there is always a way to, I guess, be bold. Yeah, of course. <laughs> something else. Yeah. And don't, so don't, you know, frame the research question in such a way that you are proven wrong. Mm-hmm. It's that this question that you're asking your the the way that you've developed the 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 way that the research has developed mm-hmm. showed something different, mm-hmm. right? So it's it's actually as a researcher, you ha- you sort of extract yourself from the question as much as possible. I know mm-hmm. so much of us, so we all identify so heavily with our research and our questions, mm-hmm. but to extract yourself from the question so that it's not you being proven wrong, it's you actually exploring. Because then that question leads to, honestly, piece what you're going to find is that question will lead to about a thousand other questions. And those thousand questions will lead to a thousand billion other questions. Mm-hmm. And you're going to have work to do for the rest of your life on this. So, <laughs> <laughs> 
So don't frame the question in a way that, 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 and, and you know, you'll, you'll work with your supervisors on this and, and, mm-hmm. and, and you'll be just great and I can't wait to hear how it goes, but you'll frame the question in such a way that it, it's not about proving yourself right or wrong. It's about mm-hmm. what are we finding here? Mm-hmm. Yeah, lovely. And, and again, this is just one of the many challenges of grad school. The second mm-hmm. one is time management. That it sure is. I'm so happy you brought it up. <laughs> and that's how we started our conversation about yeah. time management. And so let's, let's move to that now. Ooh. So let's talk time management piece. <laughs> and, uh, let me tell you, I do not have enough hours in a day. I have to sleep. I have to go to class. I have to work. I have to think because like we talked about the, the your function in grad school is to think we talked about this so i have to think i have to come up with a proper analysis i have to socialize with friends i have to take care of my mental health it's just so much to do that it feels like i don't have enough hours in a day and and and, and i and, and i am not alone in the struggle because that is also something that most of my classmates talk about yeah even just thinking about the the number of assigned readings that that we have to do for each class and then that expectation to come to class prepared having done all of the readings i think it's just how does one even manage that? How, yeah. how did you do it? <laughs> a, you know what, Peace? It's a great question. And when I was going through it, I Ooh. felt the same way you did. Ooh. And even t- today, sometimes I still feel that way, that there's so much to do in a day. How can you possibly get everything done? And so I think we should talk about strategies and, and how to manage everything. But also I want to start the conversation with the fact that One strategy is not going to work forever. That's true. One strategy won't work forever and it won't work for everything. Mm -hmm. So you may have different things where different strategies work. So for example, for me, my master's program and my time management there was very different than Mm. the PhD, which was very different than law school, which is very different now than somebody who's running two companies, right? And and teaching (laughs) plus, plus, plus. And, you know, having my own personal life. I mean, what does that even mean? <laughs> <laughs> and oh so, my but God. you're forced to have one when you're a mother. You're forced to have one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and for only good reasons. But it's a very, it was a huge adjustment. I will be honest, mm-hmm. because, shifting from student to professional to mother and professional mm-hmm. has yeah. been one of the biggest shifts that I, I think we'll ever go through. And because the time that I used to be able to allocate to different things has totally shifted. Mm -hmm. And so again, my strategies have changed, right? And so what worked for me as a a student and as a professional stopped working really the second I had a baby, (laughs) right? Like, (laughs) because your time is, Mm. is, no longer only yours. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so my schedule, for example, changed. So, I mean, every, every program that I did, the schedule changes, but then, you know, when you, when you become a parent, your sleep schedule changes. You realize that it's not just about feeding yourself. Now you actually have to like, oh yeah, I have to be home for dinner and I have to like cook dinner and make dinner. So And so that means that, you know, where before I used to be, you know, a night owl, to be honest, I would do a lot of my like best analysis at night. I would sit there with a glass of grapefruit juice because it was so sour that it would keep me awake. (laughs) That's what I did. And it was, I think it was grad school. I think it was probably my master's and PhD, even undergrad. I did that too. Grapefruit juice. And I would pick like, I I sampled a few brands and whichever one was the most sour was the one (laughs) that I picked. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and because I do everything naturally, you know, I don't, I really advocate, as you know, for, for health focused strategies and not Ooh. anything that's going to, you know, hurt you. That's going to be toxic in the long run Ooh. or even Ooh. in the short term. Anyway, so I would do a lot of my analyses mm. at night and now there's no, there's no way I can work at night. No Ooh. way. And so Ooh. before being a night owl really worked for me. And now all of my work is during the day. And that was a huge shift for me. So again, different strategies. And different things will work at different times in your life. So anyway, I want to get back to you because I've been talking about me for too long. Tell me a little bit about, 
<laughs> tell me a little bit about what, what you're, all the things you're trying to manage, because I think so many people, including myself, can relate. Ooh. Well, like I said before, I'm trying to manage, you know, school, keeping up with my readings, being able to work at the same time, socialize and I guess take care of my mental health. Yeah. Because for me, I find that when I'm able to get enough sleep and when I'm able to, when I have a good balance in my social life, every other aspect of my life seems taken care of. Mm -hmm. But when that's suffering, especially in my sleep, I'm not able to think, I'm not able to analyze, I'm not able to do my job. But in terms of strategy, I love that you mentioned the, the, the grape juice. I, I, I don't drink anything, but something that I've been doing and I'm kind of, well, still learning to do is how to go through an article in mm. how do I stay? I'm trying to find the proper way to articulate it because in undergrad, I loved, you know, what's the one I'm looking for? Tactility, uh -huh. right? I love to print my articles. I love to sit down with my cup of coffee. I love to underline, yeah. annotate, make notes. I love doing that. But now in grad school, I don't have enough time. I don't even have enough resources to print everything that I need to print. So I think it's more of like, Adjust, I'm now in grad school, I'm learning how to adjust my reading strategy mm -hmm. from the need to annotate and read every single word to being able to pick out the word, like the keynote, like the key things that I actually need from a large document. And that is something that I'm learning how to do now. I don't know if I'm going to ever perfect it because I still feel the need to annotate, to make notes. That is one of my reading strategies, I yeah. guess, to manage my time. Because I, I guess we can both agree that it's very time consuming to go to, to 200 pages of only one article out of the seven that you're assigned to read for one class, right? So it's a lot to do. So I'm just trying to learn how to go through that document and still come out feeling like I have a good idea of what that document was about. I think that's a great point. And here's the thing. Your strategy for reading for class mm -hmm. is going to be very different than your strategy for reading for your own research. Ooh, tell me more. So your strategy for your own research, I predict, mm -hmm. because the same thing happened to me, that you'll likely go back to your old way of digesting information, of the printing, the annotating, and all of that mm -hmm. with your cup of coffee. I think you're <laughs> going to go back to that when it's your own research mm -hmm. because when it's your own research, you really do have to internalize and absorb the information and engage with the information in a very different way than you have to for classes, in my opinion. Oh. For classes, you know, it's sort of, you you have a guide, right? You have oh. the syllabus, you have your professor who's taking you through the syllabus and week by week, you're talking about critical questions and engaging oh. with your peers. And so I think that what you'll find is when you are reading for class, you'll probably, I mean, 200 pages times seven is significant. And I had the same thing when I was in grad school and the same thing when I was in law school. And over time, I developed the strategy of sometimes reading before class mm -hmm. and sometimes reading after class and sometimes both. Mm -hmm. So a lot of students think that they have to read everything before class. Mm -hmm. So as a student and now as a professor, I can tell you, and I tell my classes this too, that really, as long as you have, you know, an idea of, of what your class is about that day, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you don't need to read a thousand pages, right? Yeah. You may yeah. need to skim, you know, skim a few of the readings, go into detail of maybe one of the readings, or if you need guidance sometimes on which mm -hmm. readings or what, maybe there's a priority, you know, to read one reading over the other, you can ask mm -hmm. your professor that. Ooh. Right. And you can really, depending on the class, for me, I sometimes read before, sometimes after, Ooh. sometimes I would Ooh. skim before and then read after, depending on what was highlighted during the lecture. Ooh. Ooh. Because there's no way to highlight 200 pages times seven in a lecture. Yeah. And so, and they know that, right? Ooh. They know Ooh. that. And so for some classes, like I said, I read after mm -hmm. in, in mm. detail, depending on what they showcased. Mm -hmm. And for some I read before, if I knew that the court, that the class was, was heavily based in discussion. Mm. And if I, I knew that, you know, I would want to contribute and, you know, and, and maybe even I, if I knew I'd have questions. Mm -hmm. And so, 
And but then again, when it comes and you may not be printing out those articles, right? (laughs) Which are basically like that's like a basically a whole book. So Mm -hmm. you're probably not going to be printing that out. Mm -hmm. And what you're probably going to find yourself doing is something that is uncomfortable, which is Mm -hmm. not printing it out, Mm -hmm. skimming on the computer and then going back or on your tablet or whatever the case may be, and then going back after the lecture and more closely and more deeply reading mm-hmm. the the parts that were highlighted during lecture. I Go was going to yeah. say, I was, I was say, here you are again setting me free because, because <laughs> I didn't want to admit this. Two weeks ago, my some of my classmates and I, we were having this conversation about how much work we have to do. And I told them because in grad school, unlike undergrad, in grad school, a huge majority of your grades, it's like a huge majority is dependent on participation, right? Mm-hmm. So in one of my classes, our participation grade is, I think, fully, I, I believe it's what, 60%, right? So that's, I, that's significant. I actually haven't seen one that high before, if I'm being mm-hmm. honest with you. That's, that's significant. Yeah, so 40% is independent work where you do your own analysis and you present in class. And then the other 20% is how original your ideas are, like, and how often you speak in class and the kind and the quality that you bring into the conversation. Mm. So joining that together is 60% because you have to do a lot of talking and original and you have to bring a lot of quality analysis to get the full marks that you want, right? So I remember this was a totally different class. My classmates and I, we were talking about this. And I said to them, to be honest, I read four out of seven readings. I read at least four. And then I try to have a concrete idea of three. And then when the other presenters are presenting, I listen so that I can make an analysis from their conversation, yeah. you know, tie it back to the readings that I have done. And that is how I do my best to get my participation point. Because the talking is easy, but it's the quality of what you are saying. That's right. And then I try to sit back and listen to what everyone has said so that I can either build up, like build upon what they have said, or even say something that no one has said. Because again, it's not so much the talking, but the quality. And it's the quality that people remember. Right. And that is why they can come up to you after class and say, oh, I really love that you brought that up or great presentation today. So but again, that is something that I I do because of how little time I have. I cannot possibly read seven articles in a day. And I think even students in undergrad, if there is anyone listening to the podcast, I believe that this will also set them free from the pressure of having to read every assigned readings like it's not it's, it's. It's not tenable to do that. Yeah. And I think that there's a lot of guilt around not being able to read everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly in law school, like it was sometimes absolutely impossible to read everything. And here's the thing. I think that everyone knows this intuitively, but no one talks about it. Right. Everyone. Yeah. There's this like shame around like being honest about what is like actually doable Mm -hmm. when we don't have 24 hours in a day or when we work or when we volunteer or have family commitments or have yeah. to sleep. Yeah, right? and, I think, and I think that shame is coming from academia, really, not so much the professor, but like the way that academia is structured. The, like institutions, they often have this idea that we want a whole rounded person, you know, but then punish you for the ways that you actively seek that whole roundedness. And one of those ways is, you know, are you doing your readings? Oh, you're not doing enough readings. Therefore, I'm going to fail you. Oh, I'm going to do this, right? And that results to a lot of shame because we are looking at students who have so much resources, so much time, and they are coming into class so prepared. And we, on the other hand, are over there feeling so much guilt because I can't do all the readings. I have to work. And then I cannot even imagine what it is like for international students who have to pay two times the tuition. And for them, it means that they not only have to show up to class well-informed, but they also have to work, right? So I just cannot imagine how they balance that. Mm -hmm. You know, and and it is a balancing act for sure. But, and it's also understanding because I, I worked through grad school and through law school. And I don't know, I don't know if you know, I think you, I don't know if you know this, but <laughs> the, when I, I think when we had our class together, mm. I was in law school in the next building. I was a professor in a, in, in law school at the same time. Oh, oh well, oh, professor, yes, I, I, I did know that you were teaching. But- so I'm, maybe, maybe you were my student after 
after that. But I was in the, I was teaching in the building right beside Osgood while I was a student. And so I would go to my class and then go teach and then go back to my class and then go back and teach. And oh, this, no this was every single week. Yeah. No and way. Yeah. I totally understand. And I think that another sort of mindset piece here, because Ooh. it's just as much about study strategy as it Ooh. is about mindset. So, I mean, if you don't have the mindset, the study strategy will sort of like work for a minute and then it'll Ooh. fall apart. Okay. So it's all about, everything's about mindset. Everything's yeah. about mindset. Cool. And for me and for the work that I do with my students now that I've been doing this work and with my clients, Ooh. there's also this understanding that, that I have developed that everything can't be an emergency. Okay, I'm taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm taking notes. Everything can't be a priority all at the same time. No. And somebody said something to me, and I honestly, I forget who it was, but they said to me, nothing is an emergency. Mm-hmm. And really, the only thing that is an emergency is like imminent harm to yourself or somebody else that you have to like deal with right now. You're talking to a nurse. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> and so when it comes to stressing out about all of these million other things that we have Ooh. to do, Ooh. you can't prioritize everything all at the same time. You can't Ooh. spin all the plates in the air at once. You can't juggle all the balls and keep them all in the air all at once. Ooh. And at the same time, nothing is an emergency. And I think that that is also really important because it takes the pressure off of you Ooh. to do everything all at the same time. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, even just before we got on this call, I got this email that came in. It was like, oh, no, I have to deal with that. And then this other email came in. And I was like, oh, I better do that. And then this other email. And I didn't get to any of them. <laughs> right. And now I have to go back Ooh. and open up all the tabs and figure out, OK, this is where I left off on this one. This is where I left off. Ooh. And even still, like I have developed these strategies. I'm wor- mm-hmm. like everybody. You have to work on mindset. It's not a one and done deal. Like you are working mm-hmm. on it every single day. Ooh. and. I'm still working on it. I'm still working on it and working on time management as my responsibilities grow, as the companies grow, as everything grows and you still have obligations. Mm -hmm. And so your strategies will always have to change. But realizing that that you can't, not not everything can be be a priority all at once is something that I think is important because then it causes you to take that thought one step further and say, okay, what is the priority today? Mm -hmm. Or what are the top three priorities today? Mm -hmm. And is that doable? Yeah. I think if we want to bring more balance to this, let's talk about the importance of a good support system. Mm -hmm. I was listening to the other podcast that you made with your husband, Jonathan, and he was talking about the way that you two held each other throughout, I believe, when he was doing his career switch and while you were completing your dissertation for PhD. So in addition to having that successful mindset, what is the importance of having a good support system? Because I cannot imagine possibly handling all of these things if I have no good support system. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you raise a really important point. And Mm -hmm. I think something that is so, so important Mm -hmm. is that you know that you can choose who is in your life, right? That may be a really hard conversation to have with yourself, anybody listening. And we have to know that some people will not be able to join us on our journey. There are people who you are going to bring with you and they will take you with them. And you will have mutual support for each other and mutual respect and admiration for each other and your time. And on the other hand, there will be people who will not contribute to your journey who will not support you. And it doesn't mean that they all need to be a cheerleader, but it means that they need to respect you and your time. That's true. And your Mm -hmm. energy. Mm -hmm. And so if somebody is draining or if somebody is what we, you know, what we would often say is is a taker, Mm -hmm. right? The the relationship is very one-sided in -hmm. terms of taking your time, taking your energy all the time. Like, of course, in relationships, there are ebbs and flows. Somebody needs some more support. Somebody needs less support and things ebb and flow. But we all know those relationships that are taxing, 
that after we have a conversation, we need a break. Mm -hmm. We all have those. (laughs) (laughs) And the point is that as you're on your advancement journey and, Mm. and only you can be on your advancement journey for yourself. Yeah. That we also have to remember that some people will join us and some people can be left behind and that's okay. Mm-hmm. Right? Now, yeah. it doesn't mean that you have to have a big falling out. It doesn't mean that you that something has to be wrong. It doesn't mean you have to tell them, you know, I'm I'm you know, you're you're falling away from my support system. It just means yeah. it doesn't have to be dramatic. Like I yeah. am the an advocate for like no drama, like nothing. Leave me my time and my energy and uh, like and and all, you know, we respect each other's time, we respect each other's energy. I support Ooh. you, you support, and and like everything is status quo. Everything's great. Ooh. Ooh. But as soon as somebody comes in and they start draining that and you find yourself becoming becoming so concerned with, you know, oh my gosh, we're having this conversation again. We, you know, we just had this, you know, any number of things could happen. But the point is, it doesn't need to be this whole big dramatic thing. Ooh. It could just be that you're taking time for you and you don't have to, you don't, have to tell them anything about it Mm -hmm. so for all they know you're just doing your own thing Mm -hmm. they're probably not even thinking about it yeah and it's a lot harder for what I've found is that it's a lot harder for people who are working on their advancement who are working Mm -hmm. on their personal and professional success journey Mm -hmm. that it's a lot harder to Mm -hmm. to move on from those relationships because Mm -hmm. they often feel so what's the word so like almost like loyal to that person and they feel yeah. bad attached to, attached mm-hmm. and so that they feel bad to be prioritizing themselves mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's, so that's really tough so I think you know I you have you make a great point which is that you need a support system mm-hmm. just like everybody does mm-hmm. and you also so not but but and and you also have a choice as to who is in that support system and who you spend your time with. Hmm. I think that's so important. Yeah, very, very important. And, you know, I, I'm, just, I'm just reflecting on that. And the only thing that comes to mind is if you don't do anything, you know, it's just have a good support system. Because then when, when your social circle is balanced and you have people who support you, you then have the energy and the motivation that you need to get the things that you need to get completed, done, right? Yeah. But if you always constantly have to fight and then get ultimatums and then it just takes away a meaningful time. And I think, and it's also, I, I also have to give you credit here because you are a lawyer and a professor and at the same time a mother. So you are doing it all. But a, a dominant narrative in, in the society is that you cannot do all of this as a, as a woman. You, you either have to be a mother and something else, but you cannot, that you cannot have it all. But I really love that you are telling me that you have it all and that you are still learning how to balance all of this, but not mm-hmm. one of them, like you're not suffering. The dominant narrative is you either have one or the other, but if you have both of them, one must be suffering. And I'm glad to know that it doesn't have to be that way, that yeah. I can be in a very healthy relationship have a good support system while working towards my goals and it's all about priorities that's That's right Mm -hmm. you're absolutely right Mm -hmm. you're absolutely right you can have it all you can have it all at apply yourself we tell everybody this is our mission is to help you live a life beyond your wildest dreams nobody Mm -hmm. else's yours Mm -hmm. and so if you want it all go get it and let's Mm -hmm. get you there Mm -hmm. and so this is so important because Mm -hmm. So can I tell you, so many people along mm-hmm. the way have said, okay, when are you going to stop doing this? Or when are you going to stop doing that? Or, oh, you have a family now, you know, you're mm-hmm. going to, you're not going to have time for this anymore. And in my mind, I'm like, like, hell, I won't. <laughs> yep. Yep. Who, who is anybody to tell mm-hmm. me how to spend my time and my energy and where mm-hmm. to focus and what to build mm-hmm. when I know that I can do it? Mm-hmm. But it takes, sometimes it takes people telling you no in order for you to actually think critically about yourself and say, right? But that's a mm-hmm. conscious decision, mm-hmm. is to say, I want it all and I'm going to go get it. 
God knows I want it all. <laughs> and and now you, you're getting it, yep. right? God knows I want it all. And you're getting it. Yeah. And yeah. you're getting it. And so yeah. I think that that's so... Now, the caveat here, and people always ask mm. me, how do you do everything that you do? How do you do everything? And the honest answer is, I don't do everything every day. Ooh. That's it. Ooh. That's it. I don't do everything every day. But who does? You don't work on every paper every day. You don't oh. work on, you know, every anything. Nobody does every single day, ever, oh. forever, right? You may work on something for several days in a row, oh. but then you're missing, you're, you're not missing, you're, you're not spending time on other things, but then oh. you pick those things back up again. Yeah. And so there are ebbs and flows and you, there are priorities. This is where our conversation sort of comes full circle because we started oh. talking about priorities. Oh. And this is where you really identify what your priorities are and what your priority is now, in a week, in a month, in a year. And those can change. Mm -hmm. But the important thing is that you can have it all. Yeah. Just maybe not do everything every single day because that is impossible. And you need sleep. <laughs> and you need to keep, <laughs> and you need to you know, to, to take care of your mental health and you need Ooh. to socialize and you need all these things that I've found in the professional world are, you know, there's this like badge of honor Ooh. for like not sleeping, for like pulling yeah. that all nighter or for, you know, oh, I've been working on this for like two weeks straight and I haven't done anything. Like there are these badges of honor that are attached to these actually really unhealthy habits. Ooh. When really, I think that what we need is is to shift the way we think about things and to really think about what we're spending our time on and how we're spending mm -hmm. our time doing that. Mm -hmm. And so there are a few things that I want to leave you with that in terms of strategies for time management, because I know that that's what we were, where we're talking about. So, mm -hmm. and you can tell me if these would, would work for you or not. Mm -hmm. The first is, do you have a paper planner? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. And how do you like mm -hmm. it? I, I really like it in terms of like breaking down things into chunks and actually noting things that I do, like my due dates. And then, yeah, I, I, I really do like it. Yeah. I got so, mine from Indigo. Yeah. I see it. I see it. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I also am a paper planner person mm -hmm. and I also have a digital calendar. Mm. And so the digital calendar helps me and, and the digital calendar is necessary now that I think I have like 11 different calendars think to my calendar. So there's a lot Ooh. in my digital calendar, which yeah. is why it's also so important for me to have my paper calendar because my yeah. paper calendar is just me. <laughs> <laughs> just me where yeah. I need to be in that moment. Ooh. The digital calendar is sort of like the, the everything that needs to be done. And it allows me to see things, you know, like here's everything for the month. And then you can see, you know, broader than that. Ooh. So my, my number one point for anybody who doesn't have a paper calendar already is get a paper calendar and start to write out what you actually have to do. Write Ooh. out your deadlines, map out your days, map out your non-negotiables in your schedule, Ooh. including your classes. Everywhere you have to be, put it in. Ooh. And that includes time for yourself. Point number two, schedule time for yourself. Yeah. What do you think about that? I, I think that's a good idea, but and I don't want to take this conversation like broader than the scope that we are like. That's okay. In the back, but I I just think that the idea that we have to schedule our time or time for ourselves. I don't know. We're not in class, so this is not an academic setting, but it speaks to you know this broader need for constant productivity. So in a way, I'm thinking of scheduling time for myself as. A bit of resistance, but we're not going to mm. politicize it. <laughs> no, I understand that. I completely understand what you're saying. So the point, the point of there's also an understanding of what the intention is behind it, right? So it's not just about scheduling it in just to like check it off the list and get it done. the The point of writing it in, and I don't mean you know like, and and you could some people do they schedule you know like you know, five to seven in the morning is like me time and nobody can bother me during that time. Ooh. But for me, it was, it was like scheduling my gym classes in. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I did for me. And those were only happening at certain times. And so I knew that if I missed them, I would never mm -hmm. make it. 
Yeah. Or if I missed it, I missed it. Or if Ooh. I was late, you know, you don't want to be late. So for things that one of the ways as a student that I did, I actually prioritize my own health and my own well-being was Ooh. was doing activities that that had to be that that were that were taking place at a certain time. Mm -hmm. And for me, that also filled a lot of the social aspect because I do a lot of group exercise classes. But similarly, you know, when you're going out for dinner with somebody, mm -hmm. you're writing it down. Yeah. Because you don't want to miss it. Yes. Yes. So similarly, I think for, you know, it's it's about the intention behind something. It's not yeah. it's not the giving in to the, the, the bigger like narrative of productivity. It's mm -hmm. about it's about just taking note of what is important to you. Mm -hmm. And really, once it's on paper, you're forcing yourself to take the time for it. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So, but I think that that's a really interesting conversation. And I see yeah. where I, I absolutely understand what you're saying. Yeah. At the same yeah. time, when you're so busy, mm -hmm. if it's not written down, it's not happening. <laughs> yeah. Which is, which is why I really like that, that point to schedule time for yourself, because it's a form of resistance. Like, hey, what did you tell me hours ago? Well, few minutes ago everything is not an emergency it can wait yeah. you need time to sit back and rest you know rest is a form of productivity I tell that to myself too it is <laughs> well of course it is yeah yeah mm -hmm. and so yeah and so it could even be as simple as like setting a timer at a certain time at in the yeah. evening and saying no mm -hmm. work after this mm -hmm. and yeah. so and then doing and then whether you write it down or not you know that the timer is going off because time yeah. gets away from us yeah. no doubt that could also be helpful. Ooh. And so I think that it's, you know, there are so many things. We could talk about this for years, I think. Yeah. And <laughs> so we might have to come back to this again. <laughs> but I think that the one of the one of the the takeaways, I think, is mm. that the same strategy won't work forever. When okay. something isn't working anymore, don't be afraid to change it and don't make like groundbreaking changes mm -hmm. make like little changes and see what's working and what doesn't you don't want to like abend your whole system just because like some little thing isn't working you just yeah. want to be clear about what that little thing is mm -hmm. and also just remembering and i know that you know we might have heard this before but it 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 is so different in practice to to really understand that we have to, in order to build a life beyond our wildest dreams, Ooh. you have to do things you enjoy. Yeah. You have to. And you have to prioritize that. Mm -hmm. Because then they won't, if, if you don't enjoy what you're doing, then they're not your dreams, they're somebody else's. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I've never had it said that way before. That's interesting. Just like you transitioned from nursing, so that mm. ended up being something that you were interested in, mm -hmm. but it maybe wasn't yours, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The same thing is when you're building that life beyond your wildest dreams, you want to make sure that you're prioritizing the things that are meaningful to you because yeah. that's, that's where you're going to thrive. And then the strategy will come. Yeah. Right. It's so important that we do things that we enjoy. You know, there's always going to be, you know, a class or, you know, something that we don't want to do, something mm. that, you know, we have to do that we don't want to do. But on the whole, when we look at things on the whole, we should be able to look back and say, yeah, yeah, I enjoyed that. That contributed mm. in some way. And even if you didn't like it, it still contributed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think that that's a very useful ad size, even just taking it back to how we were talking about how formulating a research question and yes. the NRP, how that process is very intensive. I cannot imagine researching something you do not like right. or have no interest in. Boy, that would be so boring. So I think that that's a very useful advice to do the things that I'm interested in. Yeah. And that's yeah. what I tell all of my students and any of my clients is if you're, you know, especially, if, for example, when I'm teaching, mm -hmm. don't pick something that you're not interested in it's going to be the whole course is going to be hell if you're working on something that you're not interested in don't do it mm -hmm. <laughs> pick something yeah. that you're actually interested in and so I think that I think that that's a, a great place to leave it peace what do you yeah. think I, I I think that's it's a good place to leave it at too like we have made a complete 360 you know tying in all of our conversations together <laughs> yes, yes, please. And I want to ask you one final question. Okay. 
What is one piece of advice that you would give your younger self? Ooh, what is one piece of advice I'll give to my younger self? To be honest, I know this is very cliche, but it would be believe in yourself. Mm-hmm. And that's believe mindset. Believe in yourself, believe in your ideas. Your ideas are relevant, original, concrete. Yeah, Amazing. that would be the advice I'd give to myself. What would you give to your younger oh. self? <laughs> Dang, nobody's turned it around on me. (laughs) (laughs) One piece of advice that I would give my younger self, I would give myself a lot of advice. I think one of them, one piece of advice would be to not be afraid to shift and that the shift is the learning. Oh, the shift is the learning. Those hard moments. And this is why... This is what informs a lot of my work with my clients mm-hmm. is that those hard moments that nobody talks about, that's, that's where the learning happens. And that would have helped me a lot when I was younger. Now I can look back and I can, you know, I have hindsight on all these things that, you know, happened and the transition and even, you know, everybody goes through horrible things. And, but I think that some of the most horrible things that have happened were all in the service of learning. And now I can give my clients the benefit of everything that I went through so that they don't have to. The shift is the learning. Oh, so many gems. (laughs) (laughs) So many gems on this podcast. Lovely. Lovely. (laughs) No, 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 no. Thank you for that. That is something that I will also take with me. The first one you told me was, if I don't have an answer, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Analysis is... And now you are telling me the shift is the learning. That's something I'll take with me outside of this podcast. So thank you so much, Adrian, for that. Oh, peace. You're so welcome. (laughs) I'm so, so happy that you joined me today. You're welcome back anytime. Thank you for having me. I am, yes. And I am so grateful that you've taken the time. And to all of our listeners, thank you so much. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Advancement Spot podcast. If you heard something today that helped you get one step closer to achieving the amazing life you want, and you'd like to learn more about working with me, I'd love to hop on a call with you to see how we can help you. So follow me on Instagram at applyyourselfglobal and send me an email at hello at applyyourselfglobal.com. I'd love to hear from you. Remember to subscribe so you never miss an episode leave this episode a review and share this episode with somebody you think needs a boost of inspiration and actionable tools to help them succeed. Thanks for joining me and see you next week.